What did you come for? If you came here to worship God, why don't you just do that right now? Someone says, come, let's worship Jesus. That's the whole reason we are here today. Come on, you didn't just come out of here out of habit, did you? You didn't just come here because it's Wednesday night, did you? Or did you come here knowing that I'm in the presence of the Almighty God? I came here because I need a refreshing. I came here because I want to get with my brothers and sisters and just lift up the name of Jesus. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to see you in the house of God today. Why don't you just turn to somebody and just greet them and say, oh, it's glad to see you in the house of God. I mean that. It's, it's good to see you in the house of God. I just want to give y'all a reminder. Easter Sunday, anybody know what day that is? April the what? April 24th, I believe. Easter Sunday, we're going to do our kingdom building offering. And I know we did that last year, but this year we're going to use it. We're going to deck out the 17th. Brother Dan said it was April the 17th. We're going to use it. We're going to deck out that new building out there. We're going to put the music instruments in there. We're going to put sound boards in there. We're going to do the sports equipment. We're going to use it to extend the kingdom of God. We're going to use it for every activity outside of these four walls. 
Scripture says where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. And I believe this church's heart is in extending the kingdom of God. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're, it's a kingdom building offering, but every bit of it's going to go to extend in the kingdom of God, some form or some fashion. Because how many of y'all believe that we're in the mid midst of growth right now? We're in the midst of revival. All it is is we're just trying to fuel that flame. We're just trying to, we're just trying to keep moving forward. We're going to worship again here in just a second, but if this is okay, we all know that we are heading into a new direction. We can feel that we're going, we're growing, we're getting into a new dimension, we're, we're, we're getting closer to God, we're having better services. But when you go into a new dimension, I've heard this my entire life and I truly believe this, there is always a new enemy. There is always a stronger enemy. See, we are moving forward, but there is always going to be something that tries to poke its head up and come against the church because it doesn't want revival, it doesn't want growth. And I believe some of you, I believe some of you have maybe been experiencing that lately. I believe some of you may have been attacked financially. Some of you may have been attacked in your body. Some of you may have been attacked in your mind, inside of your family, inside of different situations. But scripture says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. But let me tell you something, that comes when you wake up and you put on the full armor of God and you use the weapons that he has given you. You are standing by your brothers and sisters, which are some of the most powerful things in this country, is a man and woman of God filled up with the Holy Ghost. And the enemy is beginning to attack because we're moving forward and we're growing and we're entering to revival. And I believe that right now, we're, this is Wednesday night. This is the core church. This is people who know how to pray and know how to get a hold of God. And I believe that we're handling things that we have no business to be handling. And I, what I would like to do, if it's okay with you, I wish the men and women of God who know how to pray would lift up their hands. And what we're going to do, Scripture says, if you bind anything on earth, it shall be bound in heaven. Anything you loosen on earth shall be loosened in heaven. And I want you to bind together with your brothers and sisters and rebuke and cast down anything that will try to come against them. So what I would love for you to do right now would lift up your hands and lift up your voice and we're going to take authority right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we rebuke anything that would try to come against revival. We rebuke anything that would try to come against our brothers and sisters. Lord, your word says anything that I bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. I bind anything that would try to come against this church. Anything that would try to cause disunity, sickness, disease, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I take authority right now. I cast it down every imagination, Lord, in the name of Jesus, but I loosen faith and unity, Lord, to extend the kingdom of God. I, I praise your mighty name, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. And let's just lift up the name of Jesus and worship as they begin to sing and play the next song.
a good idea, Sister Patsy. Somebody just praise the name of Jesus right now. Come on, has he been good to you this week? He's been good to me this week. God, he's so good. Somebody lift up the name of Jesus right now. Just lift him up. Just, Just lift him up in your own way right now. Just magnify him a little bit. Come on, he's got you fist far. Come on, he's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, give him glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Somebody lift up Jesus right now. He's the mighty God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's far above all principalities. He's far above. greater than you. You had to walk through to get here tonight. He knows what you're fighting against at home. He knows what you're fighting against in the spirit. He knows because he loves you. He's right there with you. He's closer than you think. The Bible says that he's not far from any of us. For it's in him that we live and move and have our being. Mighty God. Praise God. I love him. Oh, man, I love him. What's that old guy say? Thank God for Jesus. I love him. I'm so thankful that, that he loves me. And I'm thankful for his mercy. I'm thankful for this Holy Ghost power that he's put on the inside of me. I'm thankful to be here tonight with like-minded people. I just believe in, in what that old man of God said in, in the Bible in reference to Hebrews, uh, I think it's Hebrews chapter 25, when he said, when we frequently and the numbers meet together, the powers of Satan are overthrown and his mischief is neutralized by our like-mindedness in the faith. We need to keep meeting together and coming together 
assembling together. There's a reason we do this. You can be seated. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And uh, this will be the first time that I've preached since December the 5th. I actually preached a message, you know. So, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm rusty, give me some, cut me some slack tonight. But uh, I'm just I'm glad to be here helping out wherever I'm needed. Uh, I, you know, my natural giftings tend to be probably in music. That's where I was born with some giftings, I guess you'd say, that, that came a little easier for me in some areas. And, uh, but, you know, we don't always get to operate in the areas that we feel good in. Sometimes God calls us to things that maybe we don't feel so sure about, and don't feel so overly confident about. And, but he didn't really call us to, to what felt good. He called us to, what, to be obedient to him and what he needs us to do. Evidently, he sees something inside of us that, that he wants to use. And sometimes it's just a willing heart. Somebody like, was it Isaiah that said, Lord, send me. I'll go, send me, Lord. I'll do it. I don't know what I'm doing. I ain't got a clue what I'm fixing to walk up into, but God, I'll do it. Just send me. That's kind of the way I was when I went over to the Philippines. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to go because he wants me to go. And the God opened the door, so I'm fixing to run right through it. And, you know, the devil may chase me all the way there and all the way home, but he obviously seen fit that I should go. And, and that's, uh, that's, that's the way the calling of God works. We just do what God says and be obedient to him and trust him all, every step of the way. Praise God. Uh, just a reminder tonight of the, the uh, anniversary service that we're going to have this Sunday. Uh, it's going to be a 10 a.m. service. We're not having Sunday school. And also remember to uh, set your clock ahead Saturday night before you go to bed so that when you wake up, it'll be the right time. Set it ahead an hour. Otherwise, you'll be an hour behind and won't realize it. But uh, just remember, it's daylight savings time begins this weekend. And uh, we are having a special service Sunday. And we would like for everyone to be here and not an hour late. So I've, I've made that mistake before it can happen. But anyway, uh, well, I'm going to talk for a little bit tonight, teach, preach, or whatever happens. Who knows? Uh, I just want to minister a few minutes tonight uh, out of the book of Acts, uh, chapter 6. <clears throat> if you ever read that book before and you're pretty familiar with the book of Acts. Chapter 6 is uh, when you have the, the Grecian widows that are griping and complaining because they're not getting the olive guard and dipping sauce that the Hebrew ladies are getting and they're griping and they can't keep up with all the work that's going on so the apostles are overrun with lots of work and church is growing like crazy and they've got to, they've got to get some help. So the Bible says that these apostles, they appointed seven deacons to help lift this load off their backs. And uh, uh, just a side note, I don't know if you realize it, but there's a lot of folks that, that appoint and elect deacons in their church. And I'm not so sure they're apostles because of the only record I have of deacons being appointed by anyone is by apostles. And nowadays we have parishioners in the church voting them in. So there you go. You may not be really talking to a deacon when he says, I'm a deacon at such and such church. That's just a side note in case you're ever wondering about deacons. Uh, the apostles appointed those guys. And uh, there's one in particular that the Bible distinguishes among those seven. His name was Stephen. And uh, I'm going to read, his, read his opener verse in verse 8. If you want to read with me, in, it's chapter 6, verse 8 in the book of Acts. It says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. This is what kind of guy he was. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of freedmen or libertines, depending on which Bible you're looking in. Some men came from this synagogue. They were Cyrenians, Alexandrians, or those from Cilicia and Asia. And in case you're wondering what this... ...from different countries who were slaves, who were freed... And it was made up of these freed guys. And, but anyway, it says in verse 10, it says, And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen or he spoke. This means that they had no defense or argument or rebuttal for the truth that was flowing out of Stephen's mouth. 
You ever been in that situation before? Somebody just outsmarted you, just flat out smarted you. It, it, you know, you really didn't have anything to say, and, and you just, it really just made you mad. That's, that's kind of what happened to these guys. They, they just could not resist what he was saying. There's nothing they could do to come back at him. It says, then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. In verse 13 it says, they also set up false witnesses who said, this is what the witnesses were saying, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looked steadfastly at him and saw his face as the face of an angel. So according to the text, uh, in the, 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 the context of what it says, it appears that the Jews have accused Stephen of speaking negatively against the temple. In all truth, Stephen was probably trying to show them a better way. So, and, 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 and they didn't want him changing anything because more than likely it was meddling in their personal thrones and with, 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 with the reputation that they had among their people in that area. And typically when you feel called out, just know this, that, that you know, you may be in, if, if your error is in the area of your beliefs and you're in error, and if your system of beliefs is what your reputation has been built upon, then you stand a chance of having your reputation brought down in the eyes of the public. I personally don't believe uh, uh, that this was nothing more than, than an issue of, of their selfish uh, personal reputation. This doesn't have anything to do with their beliefs. This had to do with their reputation. The same thing it had to do with the Sanhedrin and Jesus when he was there. This had to do with their reputation. They were just worried about Jesus stealing their thunder because he was doing it all over the place. And same thing's happening here. This We have this guy who is doing signs and wonders and miracles. His name's Stephen, and he's just a deacon. Just a deacon. And these guys don't like him because he's, he's, he's backing up the things that he's saying with the power of God. And they don't like this because he's doing the same thing that Jesus did. Surprisingly, they want to do the same thing to him that they did to Jesus. But one commentator said this, uh, you know, they, were ang- they were angry, they were hostile, they were getting really angry because they couldn't resist him. So we know when you, when you, when you can't resist someone, you know, you can't, then your next step is either to humble yourself from what they're saying or, uh, I like what one commentator said, he said that when, when men like these get outsmarted by the Spirit of God and realize that their logical force has failed, they begin to apply physical force. In the, in the, in the, in the reign of Queen Mary, when the Pope was the prevailing authority during that time, some very simple women who had read the Bible were brought in to be tried by the greatest of the Popish doctors. And even though these women should have been outmatched by these guys who were experts of the word, these these word doctors, even though they should have been outmatched, they weren't. And, 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 And because of this, they couldn't do any more than... The, the, the guys of the synagogue during, during Stephen's time, they were just, they were overwhelmed by what was coming from the spirit that was flowing through the mouth of these women. And so because they could not beat these women, they burned them alive. And, 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 and thus it, it, it terminated the controversy that they were unable to maintain. So if, if you can't beat them, burn them. And if you can't beat them with words, beat them with stones. That was, their, that was the way, and that's a good way to silence people whenever they're winning the debate is you, you, you silence them permanently. And it sends out signals to everybody else like this is what's going to happen to you if you come up against us with this stuff. So it was sending out some pretty strong vibes during those days. You know, you're going to get killed for doing signs, wonders, and miracles and promoting this new kingdom, this new covenant. So... It was a, 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 
an exciting and frightening time during those, those days. <clears throat> but it was nothing for Jews to become violent when the Spirit of God spoke through someone with wisdom that, that, that mere men could not argue with. In fact, most all of us have felt this way. I know I haven't before. Uh, at, at least a, a half a dozen times in my life where we get called out by a truth that, that was revealed that, that maybe we didn't realize at that point. I mean, it happens. And it's, and it's at that moment an individual has to decide if he's going to humble himself to what has been revealed to him or become angry and rebel against it. And, and, and I found that the older people get, the harder they become. They, they, they get a lot of, I know, I'm like that. I'm, I'm, a lot, I'm a lot harder to get to. And sometimes that's a good reason. You need to be hard-headed about the right things. But sometimes we can become so hard-headed, we, we fail to hear when the Spirit is moving. Because you know what the Spirit does a lot of times? It changes gears on us. Sometimes the Spirit jumps ahead on us. Sometimes the Spirit says, okay, it's time to make a right turn right here, right now. And we're like, whoa, wait a minute. But we were doing so good like this. Because we don't see what's coming, but the Spirit does. We're, 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 we're supposed to be Spirit-led. And usually it's one step at a time. He doesn't give you the whole picture at once. So you don't really know what He's leading you into. You just have to trust Him. But, but back to what I was saying, you know, the older we get, it, the harder it is to, 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 uh, to, 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 to surrender sometimes to things when, when something is revealed that we didn't know, that we felt like we were the authority on. And, and you know, and I didn't come here tonight to really focus on the stoning of Stephen, but, but rather the argument that he was actually making. Because if you keep reading, it can be determined that Stephen's argument leads into explaining the purposes of the tabernacle, which was only the temporary physical type of uh, and, and shadow of God's presence with his people, symbolizing a spiritual presence that was to come. So let's read the final portion of Stephen's argument. Remember, they were accusing him of talking against the temple. That's what their, their accusations were. And so here we have Stephen with his rebuttal in chapter 7, verse 44, one chapter later. It says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he, God, appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked, asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. And then verse 47 says, But Solomon built him a house. Look at somebody say, But Solomon built God a house. And then Stephen went on to say in verse 48, However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in the heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. This is the end of Stephen's argument where he was explaining how the first and original plan of God's dwelling place was a tabernacle, which was a portable structure that was created to be mobile. Look at your neighbor and say mobility. This was the original plan. This is the God-breathed plan, the one that came from God himself to Moses with specific instructions on how to build it and how to work it. It came from the Lord himself. This plan did. And it was a special kind of place that was made to house the Spirit. It was the original plan. It was a type and shadow of the new covenant that Jesus would bring and establish. Realize that with the covenant, God would us. This physical put in place only to lead us to the new spiritual covenant where God would be in us. The, 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 the Hebrews of the Old Testament never really got the picture, though. They didn't. They didn't get the picture. They didn't realize what the Lord was doing with the tabernacle. That's why Solomon built him a house. When's the last time you were able to move your house? I'm not talking about if you're living in a travel trailer either. 
I wouldn't want to move my house. It's been there since the 70s. It would fall apart. It wasn't made to move. It was made to sit there. It was designated and built to stay right there. The name of this lesson, message, whatever you want to call it tonight, is, but Solomon built him a house. Stay with me. The original plan that was given by God in the Old Testament was given to symbolize a platform whereby the Spirit of God could be mobile and go with his people wherever they went. And then towards the end of this argument, after we understand that it was God's plan to introduce this mobile tabernacle, it was God's plan, and it was built by and ran by the instructions that the Lord himself gave to Moses, Stephen then brings up in his argument the wisest man that ever lived and said, but Solomon built him a house. Most people would read right on by that statement. I've read by it many, many, many times. And, and they would write up and blast right because they knew it was coming. If you've read the book of Acts before, you know that you know the, the stoning of Stephen. We want to get to that part to where he's looking in, into the eyes of the Lord and, and everything, and, and, and he's glowing, and they're seeing him that way, and it doesn't look like he's suffering any pain at all. That's such a miraculous account. You kind of miss his argument. But he was arguing about the new covenant. He was, he was trying to take them to where they needed to be going, and, and, and they were refusing to hear it. But I believe, you know, this, this mobile tabernacle, see, it was God's plan. And it wasn't there to stay. It was there to bait our minds for what was coming in the future. It was the mobile, mobile, the movable, the, the, the movable place that, that held or in, 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 that, that, that tabernacled the Spirit of God. It says, but Solomon built him a house. I believe that those words of Stephen that he spoke in, in that argument are still speaking to us today if, if we'll listen. God is not interested in us building a special house for his spirit to dwell in. And, and, and you're wondering, well, we know this. Well, you just bear with me a little bit. Uh, if you read about Solomon, he, he was pretty into building houses during that time. He, he built a house for the Lord. He built one for himself. He built one for the daughter of Pharaoh, who was, who was his wife. He, he, and it says that he even built many places for his pagan wives to live in. And, 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 and he, also, he also built a place for, 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 for Chamos, the detestable god of Moab. And he also built a, a, a little house for Molech, the god of the Ammonites. And so, so it appears that before Solomon died, that the house that he built for the Lord ended up just being a Another house that somebody to put some, it's just another house in the, in the beginning, but he didn't quit building houses. And before it was over with, he had, he had a house built for everybody. So when everybody has a house, the house is no longer really special anyway. But he had this deal about building houses. When you build a house for something, it, 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 it designates that thing, it, it's, 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 it has a purpose. For it, and, and so you know, when when we build a building for something, it's in our nature, natural tendency, to to leave in that building whatever it was built for. It becomes a place that has been designated for something. It's it's like the building that 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 many of you work in or work out of. You know, when you go to work, you probably have heard this expression: "Leave work at work and leave home at home." And so, when we build a building. And, 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 and get it in, in the, we get in the habit of labeling that building the church. It's easier to leave the church at church, especially when we are not at that building. I believe that in, if the temple of the Lord was not originally intended to be mobile, then Jesus would not have commissioned us to mobilize. It was the first thing he told them to do. He would have said, stay close to the, by the building that houses my spirit. And, and he, would, he would have said, when you make associations out in the world, do all that you can to bring them to these buildings that house my spirit. Or should I say, invite them to church. No. He cleansed us and took that spirit 
which in prior times revealed his presence behind a veil in a location that was referred to as the most holy place on, on what was called the mercy seat. And after the last breath that Jesus made, while he hung on the cross and after he gave up his spirit, the Lord ripped that veil in twain from the top to the bottom to symbolize an end to that old covenant and took that same spirit that had presented himself in that holy place behind that curtain and poured it into us beginning 50 days after Pentecost. 1 Corinthians 3.16 confirms to us that our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. I want this to grab you in a brand new way. And, and so after saying all of this, I, I have a question for you. Have you built a house to keep God in, or are you a temple of the Holy Ghost? Are you keeping God in a building that was built with man's hands, or are you a fully mobilized temple of the Holy Ghost? He put this Holy Ghost inside of a living body and said, go and make disciples and baptize them in my name. He didn't say tell the preacher. He didn't say tell the pastor. He didn't say tell the evangelist or the apostle or the teacher. He just told his disciples. He said, I want you to go and baptize them in my name. Make as many disciples as you can. Get out there and make it because I put this power on the inside of you. That's all you need because you're a walking, living, breathing testimony of my power. Just hang with me. I'm not a church. I promise you with me. For a purpose. You see, there are in the world right now that need so much more than an invitation to a building that we have labeled the church. Instead, they need you to introduce them to Jesus. This is going to sound. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm iron tonight, and you're iron, and iron is going to sharpen iron. Stay with me. They don't need an invitation to church when you meet them. If they need something, they need Jesus. What if you call me on the phone? I had a precious person send me a text message this week saying they needed me to pray, or pray for them because they were, they were having some issues with uh, some I'm not going to be specific, so you won't know who it is, but they were having some issues with some, uh, something wasn't working right in their body. So they called me and asked me, would I pray for them? What if I'd have said, hey, you just need to come to church? Because we do that a lot. That's our answer so much. You just need to come to the church. I'm thinking, didn't you get that Holy Ghost? If, if your legs are still moving... Then, 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 then you're, you're all that God needs. You are a mobilized powerhouse of God's spirit and don't realize it. It's high time that we realize and remember who we are and what we have and why we have it. Now is the day. Now is the time for that. Right now is the time for that. These people need you to show them Jesus and reveal to him that this hope that you have on the inside of them is for them too. The Bible says that Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in me, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Don't be mistaken. Don't mistake me tonight at all. The, the, the assembling that we do here has its purpose, which solely is for refreshing, refilling, for refuge, for teaching, for instruction, encouragement, admonishing, even planning, and even occasionally to evangelize or to, 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 to do a healing or, or, or a demonstration of God. It, it, it's, it's, it's so much more than that we have here. But this is not the greatest place in the world to witness to people. For decades now, one of the number one cries throughout all the churches in America has been come. Instead of go. I never heard Jesus say come to church. I believe that one of the main reasons for 
that is because there is so much pressure from a world for this meeting place to uh, appear successful. True success of a meeting will be reflected in what a follower of Christ does out in the world after that meeting. We always think that success is always what happens in here. And so many times what's ministered or preached or taught about is something you're supposed to take with you when you leave here, and it's supposed to take effect when you get outside the brick and mortar. That's, that's, that's just, so you can take something with you. It, it, we put something back, we, put, we make it inside of you, and powerful, so that you can use it. Sometimes it's just a reminder of who you are. Uh, sometimes it's, it's encouragement because maybe been beat down by a lot of this and to lift you up and refresh you so you're on the path again so that you, that light is not dimmed by anything. We, we, we need this place. Either something happens to come the church then the meeting, if what happens at the meeting causes us to tell people about Jesus and demonstrate his love and power, that meeting was, it's, accepted by most advertisement, the best advertisement, it's out of my mouth because that's what I word of mouth. Best advertisement, a word of mouth. It's, it's, there's nothing that something special about information that a man deems worthy to be referenced personally by his own mouth. You can you can Google it all you want to and read people's reviews and not really know if it's true or not. But but when I run into to 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 Brother Frankie or Brother Scott or Anthony or Brother Ken or somebody, I say, Hey man, I'm trying to figure out what I need to do here. He's like, What? Man, this is what I've done for years, and you're talking about work great for me. Well, obviously, I'm going to go with what they're saying. Even if maybe some of the reviews saying, well, you know, these guys here have a little bit better plan. I'm thinking, well, yeah, but I know Ken. I don't know them people. And, and he said, this has worked great for him, so I just want something to work great for me. So I'm going to, where's nothing like word of mouth? If, when, some, when a man gets excited about something that he has on the inside, gets real excited about it but because what's what he has on the inside there's nothing that will replace that nothing that will replace that I like giving credit where credit's due and uh, I'll tell you what I got a girl that works for me who is a really great witness she really is she 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 lives it every day and and, she, and she's brought so many people to this church and like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not around all you guys a whole lot, but I tell you what, uh, Patricia Lively does a good job in, in witnessing people. She has a, somebody right now she's been talking to, and they're that far away from coming to church because, of, because they need something from God. And, and she's been praying for them right there and talking to them in the office. It, I, I just love to see things like that happen because whatever is happening in here, they're taking it out there. And uh, that's what we got to do. Uh, we we, we we uh, we got to be be witnesses, and, and uh, uh, but the only way you can be a witness is if you go. I'll, I'll, I'll extrapolate on that in just a minute. You know, when somebody can't wait to tell you something personally themselves, it, it just puts it in its own category of excitement and importance. And, and and so, so should the word of God, the testimony of salvation by grace, and the good news, God's mercy, peace, forgiveness, healing, deliverance. Uh, you know, eternal life in him, through him, and for him, forever and ever. That, these things, we should be excited about those things. There, there, there's been people this week that, that have, have uh, been impacted by, by, by men in our church that, that uh, they, they went to a, this individual personally to, 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 to remind him that, that, that God is good and that God still loves him and that they still have time. And, and as long as you're breathing air, you, there's still a chance for you to get yourself back like you need to be. And, and, and as long as you're living and alive, there's still hope for you. And, and you know, there's, there, you, you've got a chance to get your house in order. That's the kind of hope we get to give to people. And sometimes when people are right there at their rope's end and time is about to expire for them, but they're still alive and they're still breathing, they've still got their mind. You know, sometimes they're, they're reminded at, at those point in times, you know what, I have really messed up. And you know what, they, I believe they can repent. They can truly turn back to God. I believe that with all of my heart. 
But so when we talk to people concerning the kingdom of God, is it mostly about the building that sits here on Highway 17? About meat and drink, like the Bible says? Because the kingdom of God is, is not buildings and it's not stuff. We should be using this time to advertise the righteousness, peace, and joy that we have found in the Holy Ghost. We want to brag on Him. To brag on what He has done in us and does through us. To brag on what He has done in our lives to, to testify to them about God's great power and, and where we were at one time and where God brought us from. That's what those people need to hear. Especially in the South. There's a church on every corner. We can get to that part later. They need Jesus. They need hope. They, they need a reason to live for Him. They need a reason to, they need a reason not to just serve their flesh. To know that this life living for Him is better. That's, that's what they need to hear. We, we can get in the church on another day. They need Jesus right now. What if Jesus would have came to all those people that were just thronging him in the crowd all the time and, and as they were, they were coming to him for healing, coming to him, God needs you, Lord. Uh, you know, my, my, my daughter's possessed with demons and, they, and he says, hey, you need to come to church with me. You talking about the synagogue? Uh, all right. You know, they have to take that old devil back home with them. Sometimes I think we get things out of, out of order. These people need Jesus. When you're in conversation and you can tell someone is eat up with a spirit of fear, do you take this time to invite them to a church service or do you begin explaining to them how the Lord defeated that fear surrounding your life with power, love, and a sound mind of the Holy Ghost? I mean, are you only advertising and promoting this spot on 6045 Highway 17, or are you telling someone about the real life changing power of Jesus? The, 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 the answer that people need to be hearing when they are in need does not need to be, you just need to come to church. They, need, they, they don't need a building. They need Jesus. And if you can only, if you can only find Jesus in this building, then you have put him in a house like Solomon did his many wives. That's where I'm coming from tonight. There will be plenty of time to connect those people with this assembly after they get Jesus. In fact, they are going to want to come and meet the people that you have been gathering with and experience whatever it is that you have after they get a hold of Jesus. Because, you know, it, it, you know you, you're joining the Jesus Club whenever you get Jesus. And you, that's who you want to associate with is people who have the same thing that you have. It, that comes naturally. You don't have to beg them to come to church then. If, if we get them filled with Jesus and get them excited about Jesus, get them to come here won't be nothing to it. Because they're just going to want to come wherever, wherever you came from because, they, because obviously you introduced to them what you have. And if they're going to already be sold on where you're going, that part will come easy. He really wants us to take what we have on the inside of us and get it out there. So don't be mistaken, you're not going to find another person in this assembly who is more invested and excited about what's going on around here than me. And the reason I get excited is because this, the, the, the church, need, we, 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 we need this place to, to assemble. And, and, and come together and worship together as a single corporate body. We, we need this place to stay connected with each other. We need this place to gather for refreshing, renewal, direction, education, encouragement. We need all these things. We need this place for that. But what I'm trying to get across to you is that we must be determined to be the church when we are not at the church. Because if coming to church is the only place that you are the church, then what are you when you're not at church? Do I need to say that again? If you're coming to church, and this is the only place that you are the church, is when you're coming to church, when you're not at church, then what are you? Are you still the church? Or only when you're here? For a long time, I've, I, it, it, it's, it, it, it's troubled me to hear phrases like this for, for a long time now. And sometimes I even correct people. I probably ought not be doing that, but I do it anyway. And, but I, 
I don't like phrases like having church or I'm going to church. And I know those words are sometimes are interchangeable in the Bible. But I don't think that was God's first purpose for that word. I feel like that most of us have, have lived this way probably since we came to know the Lord. And, so, and as long as we have church or go to church, then we are training our minds to look at the church as a designated time and place. I mean, if you go to church, then, then you'll be able to leave the church. And if you're having church, then you can stop having church. And, and bear with me because there is no brilliance about what I'm, what I'm listening to say. But, 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 but the only way I know that I can stay at church and never stop having church is if I am the church. Call it semantics if you want to, but I'm convinced that this body was created to house the most powerful, life-changing force in the universe. And God gave us this power to be a witness to someone that's out there on the outside of this building. I believe that. I asked God the other day. I was kind of tired of it. I felt like I was just going days without really talking to anybody. I said, Lord... Somewhere, some way, somehow today, Lord, let me run into somebody that needs something from you. And I spent most of the day, it's like, well, you know, I'd almost kind of give up on the whole idea of it. Not time. And then it rolled around. And lo and behold, somebody was there in my presence. To be careful, I'm not, I'm not trying to identify anyone, but they were there and they were really down. Really, really, really down and due to a, uh, a lost loved one that they had, had just recently lost. and They were in a state of grief, and this happened to be that person's birthday. And they were just on the bottom. And remember, and this was a very young person that had a very untimely death that took place. And I've been around those, those situations before, and, and uh, nothing pleasant about those times. But... But I was thankful that I was there because it opened the doorway to so much more hurt on the inside of that person. And I love it when somebody talks about their hurts around me that don't know the Lord. And when people talk about their hurts around me that's supposed to really know the Lord, then I wonder how well they know the Lord. But the folks that really don't know the Lord real well, when they're hurting really bad, they need Jesus. And I know that's what they need. I get excited about it because I know that they're that far away from a, a, a demonstration of God's power. That, that, that far away from, from the redeeming power of God that will lift them up out of that pit and out of those shadows and out of that darkness. I get excited because I know that God has something for them. And God has connected me with that individual. But to be truthful, there are two places that... That you can go that won't offer you many opportunities to share this power with people who need the Lord. And those places are your home and this building that we call the church. It's not going to be a lot of witnesses, witnessing going on in the church or at your house. And if that's the only two places that you go during the week, you're probably not going to witness to a lot of people. So I would advise you to, to do like I think it was Elder Brother Lester said. He said, keep a high level of visibility. Get out. Go to the marketplace. Go to the store. Don't order it all online where they deliver it to your house. Get out every once in a while and go visit somebody and, and show that light that you have on the inside of you out in the public. And if it's not burning really bright, then maybe you need a good renewal and get your attitude straightened back out, right, where you can show the light in public. Get the fire burning again on the inside. I mean, we're in the last days. And, and there has been a voice that has been telling me that, that, that we will not be able to create enough space to seat the harvest of souls that, that, that God wants to save in this final stretch. I don't believe we're going to have enough room for it's over with. I really don't. I'm not saying that to make you get excited about it. I'm telling you, that's what God's got in mind. There's going to be an outpouring of His Spirit on all flesh and sons and daughters are going to be prophesying. It's going to be, it's going to be a, 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 a glorious, miraculous demonstration of His power in this final stretch. And, and you know, Some of the souls that we impact, they may never become a part of Pentecost Tabernacle. Do you know that? But we're working for the kingdom of God, right? 
There are people that I believe who will be put into our path that we will be given the opportunity to impact them with the power of the gospel that will become dependent upon us to lead them in the kingdom. That God's going to connect us with them, and we're going to be their connection. I mean, think about it for a minute. Do we have enough seats or enough money to buy the seats to seat everybody in this region? Don't you think that God has a bigger plan than, than, than these pews being full? We've got to think about this last hour plan, what God is really trying to do. I don't think we got enough, I don't think we can purchase enough chairs to stuff both these buildings full for what God wants to do in the last hour. But the people he's want to save, hey, he saved you, didn't he? What makes you think you don't want to save everybody else? And what makes you think that in this last final stretch that he's not going to do some pretty amazing things to show them that who, who the real and true living God is? I just believe that. So I'm opening my mind up to something greater than pews and buildings. I, I can't take this building with me into eternity. I'm trying to figure out how can I work on an eternal level. What can I do in the kingdom of God that can make a difference, even if it doesn't possibly plant somebody on a pew? There's a greater plan. We're not trying to build the church. We're trying to build the kingdom. The church gets built by default. It just happens. I mean, the, these people are never going to sit on a pew here at this church and... and Directly connect with this assembly, but they may connect with you as you connect with us. Hear me about what, uh, what I'm going to say here. I just, I'm, I'm almost done. I'm not exactly sure how this massive kingdom expansion will take place as we move into this final stretch. But I feel strongly that we, we should open our minds to something greater, something more than we have ever been accustomed to. I'm not sure what the final picture of the kingdom of God is going to look like on a premillennial earth as, as we near the end of this dispensation. But according to what I have read in the scriptures, things could drastically change as the night comes when no man can work. I'm, I'm not sure that some of the things that, that we put emphasis on now will matter as much as those as those days draw near, some of the things that we think are really important now may not matter quite as much. I'm not so sure that we will always dress up in these nice clothes and gather together here at the traditionally designated times as we always have done in the past. There may, be, may, there may come a period when we have become more strategic. We may have to think smarter to, so we can keep gathering together in order to stay connected to each other. I really don't know. We, we have to get smarter and outsmart the forces that are around us, outsmart the, the demonic powers that are, that are ruling in the earth right now so that we can continue to come together because I need you and you need me and we need each other and we need to do all that we can to stay connected in this last hour because God has a plan and he's not done yet. The church is so much bigger than a building. But what I do know is this, is that we need to make our minds up now that we will work hard and labor long and to, to, to somehow keep this connection and maintain this body of believers regardless of what tribulation is coming our way in the future. It, it's, it's time for us to push aside the petty feelings and other schisms that Satan has been trying to interject into this place in an attempt to bring division. Even he knows that, that he knows right now that the key to the survival of this body and keeping all this, the body parts attached and working like they're supposed to properly without a, a handicap or a limp or a missing limb is to keep unity. He knows that we got to keep unity in order to keep functioning right. He would love nothing more than to see this place implode from the inside out just before things change gears. There would be so many lives that would be severely wounded and so much territory may remain, it would remain untouched if we allow any division to take place now. So I feel strongly that our personal investment in the unity of this body is key to surviving and thriving during these last days that we're in. See, it's time to let bad blood die. 
It's time right now. If you're holding bad blood, get it out of your life. It's time to let old bitterness go. Let it go and get it out. It's time to release those hurt feelings that you may have been harboring. Now it's time to focus on loving each other and strengthening each other and edifying one another and building each other up until this church becomes so resilient that no force from the enemy can hinder the work that God is calling us to do in this last hour. It's time to open our minds and, and, and free ourselves from the, the old stagnant traditions of the past that only lead us to complacency and, st- and then they steer us away from being spirit led. Don't, don't let the setup drag you back off into the rut. See, the spirit's talking right now. And, you know, and when the spirit talks, a lot of times people become stiff necked. They don't want to listen when the Holy Ghost is speaking. They want to say, don't mess with my my golden calf. Don't mess with my sacred cow. Don't mess with this. The Holy Ghost is changing gears. We got to be able to move. We got to be, we got to remember we're mobile. When the Holy Ghost moves, we got to move with it. People become stiff necked. You can stand with me. Many times the spirit is speaking because change, direction, and correction needs to take place. No flesh likes to be told what to do or or, or to change or be corrected. No flesh likes to be called out, but when it happens, the flesh will either rebel or the individual will repent. The flesh is enmity or against the spirit. We don't like for the spirit to remind us of the truth about a matter that will require us to take a radical turn or change. And always remember People who allow the Holy Ghost to speak through them are setting themselves up to be stoned by stiff-necked listeners. We especially don't like what it's saying when it's meddling in our old traditions and those deep, comfortable ruts that we get in. Y'all know what a rut is, don't you? I'm talking about the kind your car tires make. I know my grandfather was talking to him one time before he passed away. and He was talking about the old muddy roads they used to drive down. When it would rain for long periods of time, he said they could just run their car off into these ruts. and They could let go of the steering wheel, and it would drive itself. That's what, that's what it reminds me of every time I hear about the word getting in a rut, and you know, getting hung up in a rut. And, and uh, you know... They're, they're made, ruts are made by traveling through the same path over and over. And over time, those ruts, they get deeper and deeper until the point you can just kind of let go. You know, Jesus, take the wheel. And it'll, it'll just keep drive right for you right down that, that, that road and, 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 you know, with very little effort at all. And this is what happens in our meetings sometimes. So many times we, we allow the antiquated service structures. And when I say that, I mean this. There's only so many, so many ways you can structure a service. I mean, if you got any good, really good ideas, you know, throw it out there on the table. But we come together and we worship, you know, whether it's three songs or five songs or two songs or whatever it is. There's only so many structures you can put together. It's going to be some preaching. It's going to be some worshiping, and, you know, and we, we're praying for a demonstration. But so many times, whenever you've already got it figured out in your head, you, you, sometimes you just run your car off into the ruts. And you know what happens when you run your car off into ruts? It always comes out to the same place every time. It's guaranteed to end up in the same spot every time when you get hung up in those ruts. We need to do all that we can to steer clear of those ruts. Give me, give me just a little something. Thank you. I know I'm, I'm four minutes over, but I'm, I'm basically done. Just a little quieter. But oh, that's all right. Just a little bit quieter. Hey, can you do some of that groovy stuff? I'm just, oh, no pressure. I'm just meddling with you. I like a little noise like that sometimes. I believe that sometimes those keys, uh, they uh, affect spirits when we play music. I'm just like that. I believe that what God has for us to do right now is so much more outside of this brick and mortar. I believe that at some point soon, the idea of church growth will begin to evolve from being made up by the number of bodies sitting on the pews to 
the number of satellite works and extensions that are connected to us. That's what I think. I think there's going to be little mini churches all over this place that have sprung off or connected to us. Maybe at different times of the week, there's going to be people where you live, way off there, where it's in Crove or Oak Grove, Monroe, wherever you live at, or Tallulah, that are going to be connected to you. And, and, uh, and, and they're going to want to come over sometimes to your place, to your house. And you're just going to get together. And you're going, you're going to break bread with them. Maybe take communion with them. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Some of you know about it. I had a small group meeting at my house a couple weeks ago. And if you weren't invited, it's because I'm, I'm, I'm not hating on nobody. So don't get mad about it. But I, I, I invited some folks over to the house because I, I just want to do something. Just try to create an opportunity and maybe impart this idea in some other people. Because I feel like that somewhere down the road, we're going to really need this. Don't invite 26 people over to your house. I, I did that. I, I invited way too many. But it didn't matter. I, I, I just wanted to do something. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to do something for the kingdom of God. Some people say, well, I'm going to sit back and wait till the Lord speaks to me. You go ahead and sit back. And as long as you're sitting, do you think he's going to talk to you? You know what he did to Paul many times? He stopped him dead in his tracks. He said, nope, don't go there. And, oh, nope, you can't go there yet. You know why? Because he had his mind made up, I'm going. I'm going. He said, go. And I'm going to go until he stops me. He took off. He got it. So many times we say, well, I'm waiting on the voice of the Lord to speak to me and tell me my location and assignment. You're going to wait a long time. It's time for us to go. And I believe when God sees your attitude of go, he'll reach in and stop you before you go somewhere you don't need to. And he'll say, hey, don't go there. This is where I need you. Because we had that attitude of go. So I asked God to help me tonight to do this. I, I'm... I'm gonna, I want you to pray with me. I'm, I'm going to pray over you tonight. Is that all right? And with his help, I'm going to pray. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray something I, I, over you, I hope, tonight, that, that you're going to take with you, that I believe even between now and Sunday, that, that there's a spark that's going to glow inside of you when you get outside of this place at some point this week, and you're going to remember the, the prayer and the power of God that, that came on you tonight. I believe that. And, and God is going to use you to impact a life and to, to help them change directions. That's what we're out here to do. Get somebody to change directions. I'm going to pray for you tonight that God will give you that favor and that anointing, that power. Let's just pray together right now.